Turn to our desk, that would be a good thing. The Senate will convene as a court of impeachment. The chaplain will lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Eternal Lord God, you have summarized ethical behavior in a single sentence. Do for others what you would like them to do for you. Remind our senators that they alone are accountable to you for their conduct. Lord, help them to remember that they can't ignore you and get away with it. For we always reap what we sow. Have your way, mighty God. You are the potter. Our senators and we are the clay. Mold and make us after your will. Stand up, omnipotent God. Stretch yourself. And let this nation and world know that you alone are sovereign. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Senators, please be seated. If there is no objection, the Journal of Proceedings of the trial are approved to date. The Deputy Sergeant at Arms will make the proclamation. Hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. All persons are commanded to keep silent on pain of imprisonment while the Senate of the United States is sitting for the trials, trial of articles of impeachment exhibited by the House of Representatives against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. The majority leader is recognized. For information of all colleagues, we'll take a break about two hours in. Pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 483, the Senate has provided up to four hours of argument by the parties equally divided on the question of whether or not it shall be in order to consider and debate under the impeachment rules any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents. Mr. Manager Schiff, are you a proponent or opponent? Mr. Cipollone, are you a proponent or opponent? Thank you. Then Mr. Schiff, you may proceed. Before I begin, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, the House managers will be reserving the balance of our time to respond to the argument of counsel for the President. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, Senators, fellow House managers, and counsel for the President, I know I speak for my fellow managers uh, as well as counsel for the President in thanking you for your careful attention to the arguments that we have made uh, over the course of many long days. Today we were greeted to yet another development uh, in the case, 
when the New York Times reported with a headline that says, Trump told Bolton to help his Ukraine pressure campaign, book says. The president asked his national security advisor last spring in front of other senior advisors to pave the way for a meeting between Rudolph Giuliani and Ukraine's new leader. According to the New York Times, more than two months before he asked Ukraine's president to investigate his political opponents, President Trump directed John R. Bolton, then his national security advisor, to help with his pressure campaign to extract damaging information on Democrats from Ukrainian officials, according to an unpublished manuscript by Mr. Bolton. Mr. Trump gave the instruction, Mr. Bolton wrote, during an Oval Office conversation in early May that included the acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, the President's personal lawyer Rudy Giuliani, and the White House counsel Pat Cipollone, who is now leading the President's impeachment defense. Now you will see in a few moments and you will recall Mr. Cipollone suggesting that the House managers were concealing facts from this body. He said all the facts should come out. Well, there's a new fact which indicates that Mr. Cipollone was among those who were in the loop. Yet another reason why we ought to hear from witnesses. Just as we predicted, and it didn't require any great act of clairvoyance, the facts will come out. They will continue to come out. And the question before you today is whether they will come out in time for you to make a complete and informed judgment as to the guilt or innocence of the President. Now, the Times article goes on to say that Mr. Trump told Mr. Bolton to call Vladimir Zelensky, who had recently won election as President of Ukraine, to ensure Mr. Zelensky would meet with Mr. Giuliani, who was planning a trip to Ukraine to discuss the investigations that the President sought in Mr. Bolton's account. Mr. Bolton never made the call, he wrote. Never made the call. Mr. Bolton understood that this was wrong. He understood that this was not policy. He understood that this was a domestic political errand and refused to make the call. The account Mr. Bolton's manuscript portrays the most senior White House advisors as early witnesses in the effort that they have sought to distance the President from, including the White House counsel. Over several pages, according to the Times, Mr. Bolton laid out Mr. Trump's fixation on Ukraine and the President's belief based on a mix of scattershot events, assertions, and outright conspiracy theories that Ukraine tried to undermine his chances of winning the presidency in 2016. As he began to realize the extent and aims of the pressure campaign, Mr. Bolton began to object, he wrote in the book, affirming the testimony of a former National Security Council aide, Fiona Hill, who had said that Mr. Bolton warned that Mr. Giuliani was a hand grenade who's going to blow everybody up. Now, as you might imagine, the President denies this. The President said today, I never instructed John Bolton to set up a meeting for Rudy Giuliani, one of America's, one of the greatest corruption fighters in America. So here you have the President saying, John Bolton is not telling the truth. Let's find out. Let's put John Bolton under oath. Let's find out who's telling the truth. The trial is supposed to be a quest for the truth. Let's not fear what we will learn. As Mr. Cipollone said, let's make sure that all the facts come out. Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, Counsel for the President, last Tuesday at the onset of this trial, we moved for Leader McConnell's resolution to be amended to subpoena documents and witnesses from the onset, from the outset. This body decided to hold the question over. You have now heard opening arguments from both sides. You have seen the evidence that the House was able to collect 
You have heard about the documents and witnesses President Trump blocked from the House's impeachment inquiry. We have vigorously questioned both sides. The President's counsel has urged you to decide this case and render your verdict upon the record assembled by the House. The evidence in the record is sufficient. It is sufficient to convict the President on both articles of impeachment, more than sufficient. But that's simply not how trials work. As any prosecutor or defense lawyer would tell you, when a case goes to trial, both sides call witnesses and subpoena documents to bring before the jury. That happens every day in courtrooms all across America. There is no reason why this impeachment trial should be any different. The common sense practice is born out of precedence. There has never been, never before been a full Senate impeachment trial without a single witness. In fact, you can see in the slide, in every one of the 15 prior impeachment trials, the Senate has called multiple witnesses. Today, we ask you to follow this body's uniform precedence and your common sense. We urge you to vote in favor of subpoenaing witnesses and documents. Now, I'd like to address one question at the offset. There has been much back and forth about whether if the House believes it, in its, it has sufficient evidence to convict, which we do, why do we need more witnesses and documents? So I'd like to be clear. The evidence presented over the past week and a half strongly supports a vote to convict the president. The evidence is overwhelming. We have a mountain of evidence. It's direct, it's corroborated by multiple sources, and it proves that the president committed grave, impeachable offenses to cheat in the next election. The evidence confirms that if left in office, President Trump will continue to harm our, America's, national security. He will continue to seek to corrupt the upcoming election, and he will undermine, he will undermine our democracy, all to further his own personal gain. But this is a fundamental question that must be addressed. Is this a fair trial? Is this a fair trial? Is this a fair trial? Without the ability to call witnesses and produce documents, the answer is clearly and unequivocally no. It was the president's decision to contest the facts, and that is his right. But because he has chosen to confess the fact, uh, contest the facts, he shall not be heard to complain. He shall not be heard to complain that the House wishes to further prove his guilt to answer the questions he would raise. He complains that few witnesses spoke directly to the president about his misconduct beyond his damning conversations with Sondland and Mulvaney. Okay, let's hear from others then. The witnesses the House wishes to call directly to the president's own words, his own admissions of guilt, his own confessions of responsibility. If they did not, all the president's men would be on their witness list, not ours. These witnesses and the documents that their agencies produce tell the full story. And I believe that we are interested in hearing the full story. You should want to hear it. More than that, the American people, we know they want to hear it. The House Republicans' own expert witness in the House, Professor Turley, said if you could prove 
The President used our military aid to pressure Ukraine to investigate a political rival and interfere in our elections. It would be an impeachable abuse of power. And Senator Graham, too, recognized that if such evidence existed, it could potentially change his mind on impeachment. Well, we now have another witness, a fact witness, who would reportedly say exactly that. Ambassador Bolton's new manuscript, which we will discuss in more detail in a moment, reportedly confirms that the president told him in no uncertain terms we're talking about the former National Security Advisor saying the President told him in no uncertain terms, no aid until investigations, including the Bidens. For a week and a half, the President has said no such evidence exists. They are wrong. But if you have any doubt about the evidence, if you have any doubt about the evidence, the evidence is at your fingertips. The question is, will you let all of us, including the American people, hear, simply hear the evidence and make up their own minds, and you can make up your own minds, but will we let the American people hear all of the evidence? You'll recall that Ambassador Bolton, the President's former National Security Advisor, is one of the witnesses we asked for last Tuesday. We did not know at the time what he'd say. We didn't know what kind of witness that he would be, but Ambassador Bolton made clear that he was willing to testify and that he had relevant first-hand knowledge that did, hadn't yet been heard. We urge, we argue that we all deserve to hear that evidence, but the President opposed him. Now we know why. Because John Bolton could corroborate the rest of our evidence and confirm the President's guilt. So today, today, Senators, we come before you and we urge, we argue again, that you let this witness and the other key witnesses we have identified come forward so you have all of the information available to you when you make this consequential decision. If witnesses are not called here, these proceedings will be a trial in name only. And the American people clearly know a fair trial when they see one. Large majorities of the American people want to hear from witnesses in this trial, and they have a right to hear from witnesses in this trial. Let's hear from them. Let's look them in the eye, gauge their credibility, and hear what they have to say about the President's actions. For the same reasons, this body should grant our request to subpoena documents, the documents that the President also blocked the House from obtaining, documents from the White House, the State Department, DOD, and OMB that will complete the story and provide the whole truth, whatever they may be. We ask that you subpoena these documents so that you can decide for yourself. If you have any doubt as to what occurred, Let's look at this additional evidence. To be clear, we're not asking you to track down every single document or to call every possible witness. We have carefully identified only four key witnesses with direct knowledge who can speak to the specific issues that the President has disputed. And we targeted key documents which we understand have already been collected, for example, at the State Department. They've already been collected. This will not cause a substantial delay. As I made clear last night, these matters can be addressed in a single week. As we made clear last night, these matters can be addressed in a single week. We know that from 
President Clinton's case. There, the Senate voted to approve a motion for witnesses on January 27. The next day, it established procedures for those depositions and adjourned as a court of impeachment until February 4. In that brief period, the parties took three depositions. The Senate then, then resumed its proceedings by voting to accept the deposition testimony into the record. In this trial, too, let's do the same. We should take a brief one-week break for witness testimony and document collection, during which time the Senate can re return to its normal business. The trial should not be allowed to be different from, each, from every other impeachment trial or any other kind of trial, simply because the President doesn't want us to know the truth. The American people, the American people that we all represent, the American people that we all love and care about, deserve to know the truth. And a fair trial requires it. This is too important of a decision to be made without all of the relevant evidence. Before turning to the specific need for these witnesses and documents, I want to make clear we are not asking you again to break new ground. We're asking quite the opposite. We are asking you to simply follow the Senate's unbroken precedence and to do so in a manner that allows you to continue the Senate's ordinary business. The Senate sitting as a court of impeachment has heard witness testimony in every other, as we've said earlier, in every other 15 impeachment trials in the history of the Republic. And in fact, these trials have had an average of 33 witnesses. And the Senate has repeatedly subpoenaed and received new documents while adjudicating cases of impeachment. That makes sense. Under our Constitution, the Senate does not just vote on impeachments. It does not just debate them. Instead, the Senate is commanded by the Constitution to try all cases of impeachment. Well, a trial requires witnesses. A trial requires documents. This is the American way, and this is the American story. If the Senate denies our motions, it would be the only time in history it has rendered a judgment on articles of impeachment without hearing from a single witness or receiving a single relevant document from the president whose conduct is on trial. And why? Why can we justify, how can we justify this break from precedence? How would we justify, for what reason would we break precedence in these proceedings? There are many compelling reasons beyond precedence that demand subpoenas for witnesses and cases and documents in this case. And at this time, I yield to Manager Garcia. Mr. Chief Justice, President's Council, Senators. Last week, I shared with you that I was reflecting on my first days at a school for baby judges. Y'all may recall that. Uh, and I mentioned to you that one of the first things they told us was that we had to be good listeners and be patient. Uh, and you as judges in this trial have certainly passed the test. Thank you for being good listeners uh, and for being patient with us. Uh, it's been um, quite a long journey, uh, but we're here today uh, to talk about the other thing they told us in baby judge school, and that was that we had to give all the parties in front of us a fair hearing, an opportunity to be heard, 
an opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, an opportunity to bring uh, evidence. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Because in terms of fundamental fairness, subpoenas by the Senate in this trial would mitigate the damage caused by the President's wholesale obstruction of the House inquiry. The President claims that there is no direct evidence of his wrongdoing despite direct evidence to the contrary in Ambassador Bolton's offer to testify to even more evidence in a trial. But let's not forget that the President is arguing that there is no direct evidence while blocking all of us from getting that direct evidence. It's a remarkable position that they have taken. Quite frankly, never as a lawyer or a former judge have I ever seen anything like this. And for the first time in our history, President Trump ordered his entire administration, his entire administration, to defy every single impeachment subpoena. The Trump administration has not produced a single document in response to the congressional subpoenas. Not a single page. Nada. That's never happened before. There is no legal privilege to justify the, the blanket <coughs> blocking of all of these documents. We know that there are more relevant documents. There is no dispute about that. It is uncontested. Witnesses have testified in exceptional detail about these documents that exist that the President is simply hiding. President Trump blanket order prohibiting the entire executive branch from participating in an impeachment investigation also ex extended to witnesses. Twelve in all followed that order and refused to testify. Much of the critical evidence we have is a result of career officials bravely coming forward despite the president's obstruction. But those closest to the president, some may say, like in the musical Hamilton, those in the room when it happened, followed his instruction. The president does not dispute that these witnesses have information that is relevant to this trial, that these individuals have personal and direct knowledge of the president's actions and motivations and can provide the very evidence he says now that we don't have. Now, the president's counsel alleged the House managers hid evidence from you. Because as House managers, really, their goal should be to give you all of the facts. Because they're asking you to do something very, very consequential and ask yourself, ask yourself, given the facts you heard today that they didn't tell you, who doesn't want to talk about the facts? Who doesn't want to talk about the facts? Impeachment shouldn't be a shell game. They should give you the facts. This is nice rhetoric, but it's simply incorrect. The President's counsel cherry-picked misleading bits of evidence, cited disposition transcripts of witnesses who subsequently corrected their testimony in public hearings, and said the opposite, and in some cases simply left out the second half of witness statements. That's how the House managers accurately presented the relevant evidence to you. We spent about 20 hours presenting the facts and the evidence the President's counsel spent four hours focusing on the facts and the evidence. And that evidence shows that the President is guilty. But to the extent certain facts were shown to you, let's be very clear. We are not the ones hiding the facts. The House managers did not hide that evidence. President Trump hid the evidence. And that's why we are the ones standing up here asking you to not let the president silent this witnesses and hide these documents. We don't know precisely what the witnesses will say or what the documents will show, but we all deserve to hear the truth. 
And more importantly, the American people deserve to hear the truth. Never before has the president been put, put himself above the law and hit the facts of his offenses from the American people like this one. We cannot let this president be different. Quite simply, the stakes are too high. Second, as this builds on what we have been arguing, the Senate requires and should want a complete evidentiary record before you vote on the most sacred task that the Constitution entrusts in every single one of you. I can respect that some of you have deep beliefs that the removal of this president would be divisive. Others, you may believe that allowing this president to remain in the Oval Office would be catastrophic to our republic and our democracy. But regardless of where you are, or regardless of where you land on this spectrum, you should want a full and complete record before you make a final decision and to understand the full story. It should not be about party affiliation. It should be about seeing all the evidence and voting your conscience based on all the relevant facts. It should be about doing impartial justice. Consider the harm done to our institutions, our constitutional order, and the public faith in our democracy. If the Senate chooses to close its, close its eyes to learning the full truth about the President's misconduct, how can the American people have confidence in the result of a trial without witnesses? Third, the President should want a fair trial. He has repeatedly said that publicly, that he wants a trial on the merits. He specifically said it, you saw a clip, that he wanted a fair trial in the Senate. And that would, would, would have to be with witnesses that testify, including John Bolton and Mick Mulvaney. He said that he wants a complete and total exoneration. Well, whatever you say about this trial, there cannot be a total, an exoneration without hearing from those witnesses because an acquittal on an incomplete record after a trial lacking witnesses and evidence will be no exoneration. It will be no vindication, not for the president, not for this chamber, and not for the American people. And if the president is telling the truth and he did nothing wrong and the evidence would prove that, then we all know that he would be an enthusiastic supporter of subpoenas. He would be here probably himself if he could, urging you to do subpoenas if he had information that would prove he was totally in, in, not in the wrong. If he is innocent, he should have nothing to hide. His counsel should be the ones here asking today to subpoena Bolton and Mulvaney and others for testimony. The president would be eager to have the people closest to him to testify about his innocence. He would be eager to present the documents that show he was concerned about corruption and burden sharing. But the fact that he has so strenuously opposed the testimony of his closest advisors and all the documents speaks volumes. You sh should issue subpoenas to the president so that the president can get the fair trial that he wanted. But more importantly, so the American people can get the fair trial that they deserve. The American people deserve a fair trial. I said at the onset of this trial that one of the most important decisions you would make at this moment in history will not be whether you convict or acquit, but whether the president and the American people will get a fair trial. The process is more than just the ultimate decision because the faith in our institution depends on the perception of a fair process. A vote against witnesses and documents under, undermines that faith. Senators, the American people want a fair trial. 
the overwhelming majority of Americans, three in four voters, three in four, as of this past Tuesday, believe that this trial should have witnesses. Now, there's not much that the American people agree on these days, but they do agree on that. And they know what a fair trial is. That involves witnesses and it involves evidence. The American people deserve to know the facts about their president's conduct and those around him. And they deserve to have confidence in this process, confidence that you made the right decision. In order to have that confidence, the Senate must call relevant witnesses and obtain relevant documents withheld thus far by this president. The American people deserve a fair trial. And now I yield to my colleague, Manager Parsons. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, counsel for the President. Last week, the House managers argued for the testimony of four witnesses, Ambassador John Bolton, Mick Mulvaney, Robert Blair, and Michael Duffy. And during the presentations from both parties, it has become abundantly clear why the direct testimony from those witnesses is so critical, and new evidence continues to underscore that importance. So let's start with John Bolton. The President's counsel has repeatedly stated that the President didn't personally tell any of our witnesses that he linked the military aid to the investigations. There is simply no evidence anywhere that President Trump ever linked security assistance to any investigations. Most of the Democrats' witnesses have never spoken to the President at all, let alone about Ukraine security assistance. Not a single witness testified that the President himself said that there was any connection between any investigations and security assistance, a presidential meeting, or anything else. Simply not true, as the testimony of Ambassador Sondland and the admission of Mick Mulvaney make very clear. The evidence before you proves that the President not only linked the aid to the investigations. He also conditioned both the White House meeting and the aid on Ukraine's announcement of the investigations. But if you want more, a witness to acknowledge that the President told them directly that the aid was linked, a witness in front of you, then you have the power to ask for it. I mentioned uh, this portion, there's a, a slide, I mentioned this portion of Ambassador's manuscript uh, in the bin, uh, beginning, and uh, Manager Schiff uh, referenced it as well. Uh, but he says directly that the president told him this. Now, the president has publicly lashed out in recent days in Ambassador Bolton. He says that Ambassador Bolton is, uh, what Ambassador Bolton is saying is nasty and untrue. But denials in 280 characters is not the same as testimony under oath. We know that. Let's put Ambassador Bolton under oath and ask him point blank. Did the President use $391 million of taxpayer money, military aid, intended for an ally at war to pressure Ukraine to investigate his 2020 opponent? The stakes are too high not to. I'd like to briefly walk you through why Ambassador Bolton's testimony is essential to ensuring a fair trial. Also addressing some of the questions that you've asked in the past two days. First, turning back to Ambassador Bolton's manuscript. The President's counsel has said no scheme existed. And the President's counsel has cited repeated de denials, public denials, of President Trump's inner circle about Bolton's allegations. None of them, of course, under oath. And as we know from the testimony of Ambassador Bolton, how important being sworn in really is. But Ambassador Bolton, as the top national security aide, has direct insight into the President's inner circle. And he is willing to testify under oath whether, quote, everyone was in the loop, as he testified before. Ambassador Bolton reportedly knows, quote, new details about senior cabinet officials who have publicly tried to sidestep involvement, end quote. 
including Secretary Pompeo and Mr. Mulvaney's knowledge of the scheme. Second, Ambassador Bolton has direct knowledge of key events outside of the July 25th call that confirm the President's scheme. Remember, this is exactly the type of direct evidence the President's counsel say doesn't exist. That's partly because they would like you to believe that the July 25th call makes up all of the evidence of our case. The call, of course, is just a part of the large body of evidence that you've heard about the past week, but it is a key part. But Ambassador Bolden has critical insight into the President's misconduct outside of this call, and you should hear it. Take, for example, the July 10th meeting with U.S. and Ukrainian officials at the White House. Dr. Hill testified during the meeting that Ambassador Sondland said that he had a deal with Mr. Mulvaney to schedule a White House meeting if the Ukrainians did the investigations. According to Dr. Hill, when Ambassador Bolton learned this, he told her to go back to the NSE's legal advisor, John Eisenberg, and tell him, quote, I am not a part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this, end quote. We already have corroboration of Dr. Hill's testimony from other witnesses like Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. And we have new corroboration from Ukraine, too. Alexander Deniluk, President Zelensky's former national security advisor, recently confirmed in an interview that the, quote, roadmap for U.S.-Ukraine relations should have been the substance, but the investigations were raised, end quote. Deniluk also explained why this was so problematic. He raised concerns that being, quote, dragged into this internal process would be really bad for the country. And also, if there's something that violates U.S. law, that's up to the U.S. to handle, end quote. Denny Look elaborated that there were serious things to discuss at the meeting. But if instead Ukraine was being dragged into, quote, internal politics using our president, who is fresh on the job and experience, that could just destroy everything, end quote. Another key defense raised by the president has been that Ukraine felt no pressure, that these investigations are entirely proper. Well, here's Ukraine saying the opposite of that. You know what else Denny Luck said in the interview? Quote, it was definitely John who I trusted, end quote, talking about Ambassador Bolton. So if you want to know whether Ukrainians felt pressured, call John Bolton as a witness. He was trusted by Ukraine, and he was there for these key meetings. And he was so concerned that he characterized the scheme as a drug deal and urged Dr. Hill and others to report their concerns to NSC legal counsel, who reports to White House counsel Cipollone. So let's ask Ambassador Bolton these questions directly under oath. The president says Ukraine felt no pressure, that soliciting these investigations wasn't improper. Is that true? If it is true, why is Ukraine publicly saying that the talk of investigations could destroy everything? And if the, if the president's administration thought this was okay, why did you use the words drug deal? We should ask him that. Why did you urge your staff to report concerns to lawyers? These are all questions that we can get the answers to. Third, the president has suggested the House managers have not presented any direct evidence about Mr. Giuliani's role in the scheme. In fact, it appears the House committee wasn't particularly interested in presenting you with any direct evidence of what Major Mayor Giuliani did or why he did it. Instead, they ask you to rely on hearsay, speculation, and assumption, evidence that would be inadmissible in any court. Well, once again, that's simply not true. But if you want more evidence, we know that Ambassador Bolton has direct evidence of Mr. Giuliani's role regarding Ukraine and expressed concerns about it. The president has suggested that Mr. Giuliani wasn't doing anything improper, and he was not involved in conducting policy by their own admission. They said he wasn't doing policy. So let's ask John Bolton what Giuliani was doing and whether the investigations were politically motivated or part of our foreign policy. He would know. Dr. Hill testified that Ambassador Bolton said Mr. Giuliani was, quote, a hand grenade, which she explained referred to, quote, all of the statements that Mr. Giuliani was making publicly 
that the investigations that he was promoting, that the storyline he was promoting, the narrative he was promoting was going to backfire, end quote. The narrative Mr. Giuliani was promoting, of course, was asking Ukraine to dig up dirt on Biden. Dr. Hill also testified that Ambassador Bolton was so concerned, he told Dr. Hill and other members of the NSC staff, quote, nobody should be meeting with Giuliani, end quote. And that was, quote, closely monitoring what Mr. Giuliani was doing and the messaging that he was sending out, end quote. So let's ask Ambassador Bolton. If Mr. Giuliani wasn't doing anything wrong, why were you so concerned about his behavior? That you directed your staff to have no part in this. If Mr. Giuliani wasn't trying to dig up dirt on Biden, why did you seem to think he was, uh, that he could, quote, blow everything up? Fourth, the president has said that there was nothing wrong with the July 25th call. But once again, the evidence suggests that Ambassador Bolton would testify that the opposite is true. According to witness testimony, Ambassador Bolton expressed concerns even before the call that it would be, quote, a disaster because he thought there would be, quote, talk of investigations or worse. Now, if the president would have you believe that the call was perfect, as he's repeatedly stated, why don't we find out? because all of the evidence before you suggests otherwise. And Ukraine knows this is not the case. The call was not perfect. Then he looked as clear on this point. He said, quote, one thing I can tell you that was clear from this July 25th call is that the issue of the investigations is an issue of concern for Trump, end quote. Or it was clear. But if there's still any uncertainty, we must ask Ambassador Bolton. If there was no scheme, how did you know President Trump would raise investigations on the call? What made you so concerned a call would be a disaster? Fifth, the president's main defense once again is that he withheld the military aid for a legitimate reason. But the evidence doesn't support that. We've heard a lot. The evidence doesn't support that. Witness testimony, emails, and other documents confirm that Ambassador Bolton and his subordinates on many occasions, including through in-person meetings with the president himself, urged the president that there was no legitimate reason to withhold the aid. But if you're not sure, if you think this could in any way have been about a legitimate policy reason, let's ask the National Security Advisor, who was in charge of that. If this was simply a policy dispute, as the president argues, let's ask John Bolton whether that's true. The president also argues that you cannot evaluate the president's subjective intent that the president can use his power any way he feels is appropriate. That's, of course, not the case. Whether his intent was corrupt is a central part of this case, as it is in nearly every criminal case in the country. As a backup arg argument, however, the president claims that, that you know, we want you to read the president's mind. Juries, of course, this are routinely... The entire impeachment process is about the House manager's insistence that they are able to read everybody's thoughts, they can read everybody's intention, they think you can read minds. They want to tell you what President Trump thought. Of course, are routinely asked to determine the defendant's state of mind. That's central to almost every criminal case in the country. And it's disingenuous for the president's counsel to argue that the defendant's state of mind is unknowable, that it requires a mind reader, or is anything but the most common element of proof of any crime, constitutional or otherwise. But if you want more information, let's ask the president whether John Bolton can help fill in any gaps about his state of mind. Uh, if you think about it, John, he knows some of my thoughts. He knows what I think about leaders. The case is about the president's conduct in Ukraine. John Bolton knows a lot about that. Let's hear from him. A fair trial demands it. And it's more than just ensuring a fair trial. It's about remembering that in America, truth matters. As Mr. Bolton said on January 30th, quote, the idea that somehow testifying to what you think is true 
is destructive to the system of government we have, I think is very nearly the reverse. The exact reverse of the truth, in quote. Now, as Manager Schiff started this out, the truth continues to come out. Again, in an article today, more information. The truth will come out, and it's continuing to. The question here before this body is what do you want your place in history to be? Do you want your place in history to be let's hear the truth or that we don't want to hear it? Given our time constraints, we will now summarize the reasons why Mr. Mulvaney, Mr. Duffy, and Mr. Blair are also important. Let's turn first to Mr. Mulvaney. To begin with, Mr. Mulvaney participated in meetings and discussions with President Trump at every single stage of this scheme. We just talked about motive and intent. Well, if you want further insight, into the president's motives or intent, further direct evidence of why he withheld the military aid in the White House meeting, you should call his acting chief of staff, who had more access than anyone. Mr. Mulvaney is important because the president's counsel continues to argue incorrectly that our evidence is just hearsay and speculation. Faced with Ambassador Sondland and Mr. Holmes saying this was all as clear as two plus two equals four, the president says they are just guessing. That is simply not true. The evidence is direct. The evidence is compelling and confirmed by many witnesses, corroborated by text messages, emails, and phone records. But if you want more evidence, if you want another first-hand account for why the aid was withheld for the undisputed quid pro quo for that White House meeting, let's just hear from Mick Mulvaney. Over and over again, Ambassador Sondland described to multiple witnesses how Mr. Mulvaney was directly involved in the president's scheme. Here's some of that testimony. And so when I came in, uh, Gordon Sondland uh, was basically saying, well, look, we have a deal here that there will be a meeting. I have a deal here with, uh, with uh, Chief of Staff Mulvaney. There will be a meeting if the Ukrainians open up or announce these investigations and, uh, into 2016 in Burisma. And I cut it off immediately there. Ambassador Bolton told me that I am not part of uh, this whatever drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland are cooking up. What did you understand him to mean by the drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland were cooking up? I took it to mean investigations for a meeting. Did you go speak to the lawyers? I certainly did. What I want to ask you about is he makes reference in that drug deal to a drug deal cooked up by you and Mulvaney. Um, it's the reference to Mulvaney that I want to ask you about. Um, you've testified in that Mulvaney was aware of this quid pro quo, of this condition that the Ukrainians had to meet, that is, announcing these public investigations to get the White House meeting. Is that right? Yeah, a lot of people were aware of it. Um, and In including, about, including Mr. Mulvaney. Correct. Remarkably, the president is still denying the facts, even as they argue that if it's true, it's still not impeachable. But if the president did nothing wrong, if he held up the aid because of so-called corruption or burden-sharing reasons, he should want his chief of staff to come testify under oath before this distinguished body and say just that. Why doesn't he want Mulvaney to appear before the United States Senate? Well, we know the answer. 
because Mr. Mulvaney will confirm the corrupt shakedown scheme. Because Mr. Mulvaney was in the loop. Everyone was in the loop. As Ambassador Sondland summarized in his testimony on July 19th, he emailed several top administration officials, including Mr. Mulvaney, that President Zelensky was prepared to receive POTUS's call and would assure President Trump that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation and will turn over every stone. Mr. Mulvaney replied, I asked NSC to set it up for tomorrow. The above email seems clear. Ambassador Sondland testified that it was clear, that he was confirming to Mr. Mulvaney that he had told President Zelensky he had to tell President Trump on that July 25th call that he would announce the investigation, which he explained was a reference to one of the two phony political investigations that President Trump wanted. And Mr. Mulvaney replies that he'll set up the meeting, consistent with the agreement that Sondland explained he'd reach with Mr. Mulvaney to condition a meeting on the investigations. But if there's any uncertainty, if there's any lingering questions about what this means, let's just question Mick Mulvaney under oath. Mr. Mulvaney also matters because we have heard several questions from this distinguished body of senators wanting to understand when or why or how the president ordered the hold on the security aid. As the head of the Office of Management and Budget, Mr. Mulvaney has unique insights into all of these questions. Your questions. Remember that email exchange between Mr. Mulvaney and his deputy, Rob Blair, on June 27th? when Mulvaney asked Blair about whether they could implement the hold, and Blair responded that it could be done but that Congress would become unhinged. It wasn't just Congress. It was the Independent Government Accountability Office that determined that the President's hold violated the law. But if the President's counsel is going to argue without evidence that he withheld the aid as part of U.S. foreign policy, it seems to make sense that the Senate should hear directly from Mr. Mulvaney, who has firsthand knowledge of exactly these facts. He said so himself. Again, I was, I was involved with the, uh, the process by which the money was held up temporarily. Okay. Why doesn't President Trump want Mick Mulvaney to testify? Why? Perhaps here's why. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely. No question about that. Um, but that's it. And that's why we held up the money. Now, there was a report. So, so, so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was on the, to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is holding, absolutely appropriate. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the into the Democratic server uh, happened as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. We were holding up money at the same time for, uh, what was it, the Northern Triangle com countries. We were holding up aid at the Northern Triangle countries so that they, uh, so that they would change their policies on immigration. By, by the way, and this speaks, to a, this speaks to an important, I'm sorry? 
This speaks to an important point, because I heard this yesterday, and I can never remember the gentleman who testified. Was it McKinney, the guy? Is that his name? For the, I don't, don't know him. He testified yesterday. And if you go, and if you believe the news reports, okay, because we've not seen any transcripts of this. The only transcript I've seen was Sondland's testimony morning, this morning. If you read the news reports and you believe them, what did McKinney say yesterday? Well, McKinney said yesterday that he was really upset with the political influence in foreign policy. That was one of the reasons he was so upset about this. And I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. Is that what the Constitution requires? Get over it? Is that good enough for this body, the world's greatest deliberative body? Get over it? The President's counsel can try to emphasize Mr. Mulvaney and his attorney's efforts to walk back this statement. But as you've seen with your own eyes, the statement was unequivocal. And even when given the chance in real time on that day, on October 17th, to deny a quid pro quo, he doubled down. Get over it, he said. But if you have any questions about what the real answer is, where the truth lies, there's only one way to find out. Let's all just question Mr. Mulvaney under oath during a Senate trial. After all, counsel said that cross-examination was the greatest vehicle in the history of American jurisprudence ever invented to ascertain the truth. Your standard. Finally, I'd like to touch briefly on the importance of Mr. Blair and Mr. Duffy to this case. The President's lawyers have argued that withholding foreign aid is entirely within his right as Commander-in-Chief, that this was a normal, ordinary decision, and that this is all just one big policy disagreement. We have proven exactly the opposite. This can't be a policy disagreement because the President's hold actually went against U.S. policy. The hold was undertaken outside of the normal channels by a president who they admit was not conducting policy. The hold was concealed not only from Congress, but from the president's own officials responsible for Ukraine policy. And most importantly, the hold violated the law. The president has the right to make policy, but he does not have the right to break the law and coerce an ally into helping him cheat in our free and fair elections. And he doesn't have a right to use hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer funds as leverage to get political dirt on an American citizen who happens to be his political opponent. But if you remain unsure about all of this, who better to ask than Mr. Blair or Mr. Duffy? They oversaw and executed the process of withholding the aid. They can tell us exactly how unrelated to business as usual this whole shakedown scheme was when it was underway. They can testify about why the aid was withheld and whether there was any legitimate explanation for withholding it. Some of you have asked that very question. Multiple officials, including Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Taylor, David Holmes, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, Jennifer Williams, and Mark Sandy all testified that they were never given a credible explanation for the hold. So let's ask Mr. Blair, let's ask Mr. Duffy if this happens all the time, as Mick Mulvaney suggests. Why at this time, in connection with this scheme, were all of those witnesses left 
in the dark. Despite the president's refusal to produce a single document, to produce a shred of information in this impeachment inquiry undertaken in the House, his administration did produce 192 pages of Ukraine-related email records in Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, albeit in heavily redacted form. These documents confirm Mr. Duffy's central role in executing the hold. He's on nearly every single email released. Nearly every single email. Here's an important email from that production. Just 90 minutes after the July 25th call, Mr. Duffy emailed officials at the Department of Defense that they should hold off on any additional DOD obligations of these funds. Mr. Duffy added that the request was sensitive and that they should keep this information closely held. The timing is important because if the aid wasn't linked to the July 25th call, if it wasn't related, why the sensitive, closely held request made within two hours of that call? Let's just ask Mr. Duffy. Mr. Duffy and Mr. Blair can testify about the concerns raised by DOD to the Office of Management and Budget, about the illegality of the hold, and why it remained in place even after DOD warned the administration that it would violate the Impoundment Control Act. Now, the President, of course, has disputed this fact. But we have demonstrated that OMB was warned repeatedly by DOD officials of two things. First, continuing to withhold the aid would prevent the Department of Defense from spending the money before the end of the fiscal year. And second, the hold was potentially illegal, as turned out to be the case. By August 9th, DOD told Mr. Duffy directly that DOD, the Department of Defense, could no longer support the Office of Management and Budget's claims that the hold would not preclude timely execution of the aid for Ukraine, our vulnerable ally at war with Russian-backed separatists. Yet, as Mr. Duffy reportedly told Ms. McCuster at the Department of Defense on August 30th, there was a clear direction from POTUS to continue to hold. Clear direction from the President of the United States to continue the hold. So how did Mr. Duffy understand the clear direction to continue the hold? Why is the President claiming that this wasn't unlawful? When DOD, the Department of Defense, repeatedly warned his administration that it was. Wouldn't we all like to ask Mr. Duffy these questions? Finally, here's another reason why we know this was not business as usual. On July 29th, Mr. Duffy, a political appointee with zero relevant experience, abruptly seized responsibility for withholding the aid from Mark Sandy, a career Office of Management and Budget official, seized the responsibility from a career official. Mr. Duffy provided no credible explanation for that decision. Mr. Sandy testified that nothing like that had ever happened 
in his entire governmental career. Let's think about that. If this is as routine as the president claims, why is a career official saying he's never seen anything like this happen before? Mr. Duffy knows why. Shouldn't we just take the time to ask him? The American people deserve a fair trial. The Constitution deserves a fair trial. The president deserves a fair trial. A fair trial means witnesses. A fair trial means documents. A fair trial means evidence. No one is above the law. I now yield to my distinguished colleague, Manager Lofgren. Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, it's not just about hearing from witnesses. You need documents. The documents don't lie. There are specific documents relevant to this, to this impeachment trial in the custody of the White House, OMB, DOD, and the State Department, and the President has hidden them from us. I'm not going to go through <clears throat> each category again in detail, but here are some observations. This is, of course, an impeachment case against the President of the United States. Nothing could be more important. And the most important documents, documents that go directly to who knew what when, are being held by the executive branch. Many of these records are at the White House. The White House has records about the phone calls with President Zelensky, about scheduling uh, an Oval Office meeting with President Zelensky about the President's decision to hold security assistance, about communications among his top aides, about concerns raised by public officials with legal counsel. We've heard about Ambassador Bolton's handwritten notes and book manuscript and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman's presidential policy memorandum. We know of reports about a number of emails in early August trying to create after-the-fact justifications for the hold, but we haven't seen any of them. They're at the White House, being hidden by the President. I think it's a cover-up. Documents at the State Department, records about the recall of Ambassador Yovanovitch, about Mr. Giuliani's efforts for the President, about concerns raised about the hold, about the Ukrainian reaction to the hold, and when exactly they learned about it. About negotiations with the Ukrainians for an Oval Office meeting. We know of Ambassador Taylor's first person cable and notes and Mr. Kent's memos to file. We know about Mr. Sondland's emails with Pompeo and Breckbull and Mulvaney and Perry, but we haven't seen them. They're sitting at the State Department. DOD and OMB also have records, records about President Trump's hold on military aid to Ukraine, about the justification for the hold, about hiding the hold from Congress and trying to justify the hold after the fact, and about why the hold was lifted, but we haven't seen them. They're at DOD and OMB. Why haven't we seen them? Because the President directed all of his agencies not to produce them. This trial should not reward the President's really unprecedented obstruction by allowing him to control what evidence you see and what will remain hidden. You should ask for these documents on behalf of the American people, and you should ask for these documents to get the truth yourself. Now let's come back to the issue of delay, since the President's lawyers have suggested that having witnesses and documents would make this trial take too long. There will be lengthy court battles, they say. The President might even invoke executive privilege for the very first, very first time in this entire impeachment process. It would be better, we're told, to skip straight to the final verdict, to break from centuries of precedent and end this trial without hearing from a single witness, without reviewing a single document that the President ordered hidden. Respectfully, that shouldn't happen. 
House managers aren't interested in delaying these proceedings. We're interested in the full truth. In a trial that is fair to the parties and to the American people, in the facts that the President's counsel agrees are so critical to this trial. It's why we've said we won't go to court. We'll follow all the rulings of the Chief Justice. We can get the witness depositions done in a week. In fact, I know we can because if you, the senators, order it, that's the law. You have the sole power to try impeachments. If questions or objections come up, including objections based on executive privilege, the Senate itself and the Chief Justice in the first instance can resolve them. We aren't suggesting that the President waive executive privilege. We simply suggest that the Chief Justice can resolve issues related to any assertion of executive privilege. As the Supreme Court recognized in the case of Judge Walter Nixon, judges will stay out of disputes over how the Senate exercises its sole power to try impeachments. That ensures there will be no unnecessary delay, and it's why we propose we suspend the trial for one week and that during that time, you go back to business as usual. While the trial is suspended, we'll take witness depositions, review the documents that are provided at your direction. The four witnesses you should hear from are readily available. Ambassador Bolton has already said he will appear. We can and would move quickly to depose these witnesses within a week of the issuance of subpoenas. The documents, too, are ready to be produced. We're ready to review them quickly and to present additional evidence. Meanwhile, the Senate can continue going about its important legislative work as it did during the depositions in the Clinton impeachment trial. The President's opposition to this suggestion says a lot. The President is the architect of the very delay he warns against. He could easily avoid it. He could move things along. He could stop trying to silence witnesses and hide evidence. I think he's afraid the truth will come out. He hopes his threats of continued delay, however unjustified, will cause you to throw up your hands and give up on a fair trial. Please don't give up. This is too important for our democracy. A decision to forego witnesses and documents at this trial would be a big departure from Senate precedent. When the Senate investigated Watergate, it heard from the highest White House officials. That happened because a bipartisan majority of the Senate insisted. We got to the truth then because the Senate came together and put a fair proceeding above party loyalty. We should all want the truth, and so we ask you, do it again, that you put aside any politics, party loyalty, belief in your president, which we understand and sympathize with, but subpoena the documents and the witnesses necessary to make this a fair trial, to hear and see the evidence you need to impartially administer justice. Now, there's been a lot of discussion of executive privilege during this trial. Even if the president asserts executive privilege, something he has not yet done, it wouldn't harm the president's legal rights or cause undue delay, and here's why. Let's focus on John Bolton, since this week's revelations confirm the importance of his testimony. First, as a private citizen, John Bolton is fully protected by the First Amendment if he wants to testify. There's no basis for imposing prior restraint for censoring him just because some of his testimony could include conversations with the president. That's commonplace. As long as his testimony isn't classified, it is shielded by the free speech clause, by the First Amendment. Ambassador Bolton has written a book. It's inconceivable that he is forbidden from telling the United States Senate, sitting as a high court of impeachment, information that shortly will be in print. If the president did attempt to invoke executive privilege, he would fail. It's true for se two separate reasons. First, claims of executive privilege always involve a balancing of interests. The Supreme Court confirmed in U.S. v. Nixon, the Nixon tapes case, that executive privilege can be overcome 
by a need for evidence in a criminal trial. That is even more true here in an impeachment trial of the President of the United States, which is probably the most important interest under the Constitution. It would certainly outweigh any claim of privilege. Precedent confirms the point. To name just a few, national security advisors for President Carter, Zbigniew Brzezinski, President Clinton, Samuel Berger, President George W. Bush, Condoleezza Rice, and President Obama, Susan Rice, testified in congressional investigations. These advisors discussed their communications with top government officials, including the presidents they served. There is no reason why all of these officials uh, could, not testif could testify in the normal course of events and hearings, but Ambassador Bolton, a former official, couldn't testify in the most important trial there could possibly be. The second reason is the President waived any claim of executive privilege about Ambassador Bolton's testimony. All 17 witnesses testified in the House about these matters without any assertion of privilege by the President. President Trump, as well as his lawyers and senior officials, have publicly discussed and tweeted about these issues at some length. The President has also directly denied reports about what Ambassador Bolton will say in his forthcoming book. Under these circumstances, the President can be, cannot be allowed to tell his version of the story to the public while using executive privilege to silence a key witness who would contradict him. You shouldn't let the President escape responsibility only to later see clearly what happened in Ambassador Bolton's book. There are no national security risks here. The President has declassified the two phone calls with President Zelensky. All 17 witnesses testified about the President's conduct regarding Ukraine. We aren't interested in asking about anything other than Ukraine. That's simply a bogus argument. The Constitution uses the word sole power only twice. First, when it gives the House sole power to impeach. And second, Article 1, Section 3, where it gives the Senate sole power to try impeachments. And here's what it says. The Senate shall have the sole power to try all impeachments. When the President of the United States is tried, the Chief Justice shall preside. Now, I think that provision in the Constitution means something. It's up to the Senate to decide how to try this impeachment with fairness, with witnesses, and documents. Privileges asserted can be decided using the process that you devise. That's not unconstitutional. It's what the Constitution provides. You have the power. You decide. Please decide for a fair trail that will yield the truth and serve our Constitution and the American people. I yield now to Manager Schiff. Senators, before we yield to uh, counsel for the President, I'd like to take a moment by talking about uh, what I think is at stake here. A no vote on the question before you will have long-lasting and harmful consequences long after this impeachment trial is over. We agree with the President's counsel on this much. This will set a new precedent. This will be cited in impeachment trials from this point to the end of history. You can bet in every impeachment that follows, whether it is a presidential impeachment or the impeachment of a judge, if that judge or president believes that it is to his or her advantage that there shall be a trial with no witnesses, they will cite the case of Donald J. Trump. They will make the argument that you can adjudicate the guilt or innocence of the party who is accused without hearing from a single witness, without reviewing a single document. And I would submit that will be a very dangerous and long-lasting precedent that we will all have to live with. President Trump's wholesale obstruction of Congress strikes at the heart of our Constitution and democratic system of separation of powers. Make no mistake, 
the President's actions in this impeachment inquiry constitute an attack on congressional oversight, on the co-equal nature of this branch of government, not just on the House, but on the Senate's ability as well to conduct its oversight to serve as a check and balance on this President and every President that follows. If the Senate allows President Trump's obstruction to stand, it effectively nullifies the impeachment power. It will allow future presidents to decide whether they want their misconduct to be investigated or not, whether they would like to participate in an impeachment investigation or not. That is a power of the Congress. That is not a power of the president. By permitting a categorical obstruction, it turns the impeachment power against itself. How do we respond to this unprecedented obstruction will shape future debates between our branches of government and the executive forever. And it's not just impeachment. The ability of Congress to conduct meaningful and probing oversight, oversight that by its nature is intended to be a check and balance on the awesome powers of the executive branch, hinges on our willingness to call witnesses and compel documents that President Trump is hiding with no valid justification, no presidential support. If we tell the president effectively, you can act corruptly, you can abuse the powers of your office to coerce a foreign government to helping you cheat in an election by withholding military aid, and when you're caught, you can further abuse your powers by concealing the evidence of your wrongdoing, the president becomes unaccountable to anyone. Our government is no longer a government with three co-equal branches. The president effectively, for all intents and purposes, becomes above the law. This is, of course, the opposite of what the framers intended. They purposely entrusted the power of impeachment to the legislative branch so that it may protect the American people from a president who believes that he can do whatever he wants. So we must consider how our actions will reverberate for decades to come and the impact they will have on the functioning of our democracy. And as we consider this critical decision, it's important to remember that no matter what you decide to do here, whether you decide to hear witnesses and relevant testimony, the facts will come out in the end. Even over the course of this trial, we have seen so many additional facts come to light. The facts will come out. In all of their horror, they will come out. And there are more court documents and deadlines under the Freedom of Information Act. Witnesses will tell their stories in future congressional hearings in books and in the media. This week has made that abundantly clear. The documents the president is hiding will come out. The witnesses the president is concealing will tell their stories. And we will be asked why we didn't want to hear that information when we had the chance when we could consider its relevance and importance in making this most serious decision. What answer shall we give if we do not pursue the truth now, if we allow it to remain hidden until it is too late to consider on the profound issue of the president's innocent or guilt? What we are asking you to do on behalf of the American people is simple. Use your sole power to try impeachment by holding a fair trial. Get the documents they refuse to provide to the House. Here are the witnesses they refuse to make available to the House, just as this body has done in every single impeachment trial until now. Let the American people know that you understand they deserve the truth. Let them know you still care about the truth, that the truth still matters. Though much divides us, on this we should agree. A trial stripped 
of all its trappings should be a search for the truth. And that requires witnesses and testimony. Now, you may have seen just this afternoon the President's former Chief of Staff, General Kelly, said that a Senate trial without witnesses is a job only half done. Trial without witnesses is only half a trial. Well, I have to say I can't agree. Trial without witnesses, no trial at all. You either have a trial or you don't. And if you're going to have a real trial, you need to hear from the people who have firsthand information. Now, we presented some of them to you. But you know as well as we, there are others that you should hear from. But let me close this portion with words I think more powerful than General Kelly's, and they come from John Adams, who in 1776 wrote, together with the right to vote, those who wrote our Constitution considered the right to trial by jury, the heart and lungs, the mainspring and the center wheel of our liberties, without which the body must die, the watch must run down, the government must become arbitrary. Now, what does that mean? Without a fair trial, the government must become arbitrary. Now, of course, he's talking about the right of an average citizen to a trial by jury. Well, if in courtrooms all across America, when someone is tried, but they're a person of influence and power, they can declare at the beginning of the trial, if the government's case is so good, let them prove it without witnesses. If people of power and influence can insist to the judge that the House, that the prosecutors, that the government, that the people must prove their case without witnesses or documents, a right reserved only for the powerful. Because you know, only Donald Trump only Donald Trump of any defendant in America can insist on a trial with no witnesses. If that should be true in courts throughout the land, then as Adams wrote, the government becomes arbitrary. Because whether you have a fair trial or no trial at all depends on whether you are a person of power and influence like Donald J. Trump. The body will die, the clock will run down, and our government becomes arbitrary. The importance of a fair trial here is not less than in every courtroom in America. It is greater than in any courtroom in America because we set the example for America. I said at the outset, and I'll repeat again, your decision on guilt or innocence is important, but it's not the most important decision. If we have a fair trial, however that trial turns out, whatever your verdict may be, at least we can agree we had a fair trial. At least we can agree that the House had a fair opportunity to present its case. At least we can agree that the President had a fair opportunity to present their case, if we have a fair trial. And we can disagree about the verdict, but we can all agree the system worked as it was intended. We had a fair trial, and we reached a decision. Rob this country of a fair trial, and there can be no representation that the verdict has any meaning. How could it if the result is baked in by the process? Assure the American people, whatever the result may be, that at least they got a fair shake. There's a reason why the American people want to hear from witnesses. And it's not just about curiosity. It's because they recognize that in every courtroom in America, that's just what happens. And if it doesn't happen here, the government has become arbitrary. There is one person who is entitled to a different standard, 
and that's the President of the United States. And that is the last thing the founders intended. We reserve the balance of our time. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief the Justice, majority leader is recognized. I request the Senate take a 15 minute recess. Without ordered.
Please be seated. Ready to hear the uh, presentation from Council for the President. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, the House managers have said throughout their presentation and throughout all of the proceedings here again and again that you can't have a trial without witnesses and documents, as if it's just that simple. If you're going to have a trial, there have to be new witnesses and documents. But it's not that simple. And that's really something that is a trope that's being used to disguise the real issues, the real decisions that you'd be making on this, on this decision about witnesses. Because there's a lot more at stake there. And let me unpack that and explain what's really at stake there. The first is this idea that if you come to trial, you've always got to go to witnesses, have new witnesses come in and that. But that's not true. In every legal system, and in our legal systems on both civil and criminal sides, there's a way to, to decide right up front in some quick way whether there's really a triable issue, whether you really need to go to all the trouble of calling in new witnesses and having more evidence and something like that. And there's not here. There's no need for that. Because these articles of impeachment on their face are defective. And we've explained that. Let me start with the second article on the obstruction charge. We've explained that that charge is really trying to say that it's an impeachable offense for the president to defend the separation of powers. That can't be right. But it's also the case that no witnesses are going to say anything that makes any difference to the second article of impeachment. That all has to do with the validity of the grounds the president asserted, the fact that he asserted long-standing constitutional prerogatives of the executive branch in specific ways to resist specific deficiencies in the subpoenas that were issued. No fact witness is going to come in and say anything that relates in any way to that. It's not going to make any difference. And on the first article of impeachment, that too is defective on its face. And we've explained, we heard it again today here, that the way they, they have this subjective theory of impeachment, that will show abuse of power by focusing just on the president's subjective motives. And they said again today here, that the way they can show the president did something wrong is that he defied the foreign policy of the United States. And we talked, I talked about that before, this theory that he defied the agencies within the executive branch. He wasn't following the policy of the executive branch. That's not a constitutionally coherent statement. The theory of abuse of power that they framed in the first article of impeachment would do grave damage to the separation of powers under our Constitution. Because it would become so malleable, they can pour into it anything they want to find illicit motives for some perfectly permissible action. It becomes so malleable, it's no different than maladministration, the exact ground that the framers rejected during the Constitutional Convention. The Constitution defines specific offenses. It limits and constrains the impeachment power. Now, there's also the fact that we actually heard from a lot of witnesses. We heard from a lot of witnesses in the proceedings so far. You've heard 192 video clips, by our count, from 13 different witnesses. There were 17 witnesses deposed in closed hearings in the House, and 12 of them testified again in open hearings. You've got all of those transcripts, so you can see the witnesses' testimony there. The key portions have been played for you on the screens. And you've got over 28,000 pages of documents and transcripts. You've got a lot of evidence already. But there's another principle that they overlook when they say, well, if you're going to have a trial, there just have to be witnesses, as if the most ordinary thing is you get to trial and then start subpoenaing new witnesses and documents. That's not true either. And we pointed this out. There's, in the regular courts, the way things work is you've got to do a lot of work 
preparing a trial called discovery to find out about witnesses and depose them and find out about documents before you get to trial. You can't show up the day of trial and say, oh, Your Honor, actually, we're not ready. We didn't subpoena John Bolton or Witness X or Witness Y. And now we want to subpoena that witness. Now we want to do discovery. And why does that matter here? Because here, to show up not having done the work and to expect that work to be done in the Senate by this body has grave consequences for the institutional interests of this body, and it sets a precedent, really it sets an important precedent for two bodies, for the Senate and for the House. Because what the Senate accepts as an impeachment coming from the House determines not just precedent for the Senate, but really precedent for the House in the future as well. If the procedures used in the House to bring this proceeding here to this stage are accepted, if the Senate says, yes, we'll start calling new witnesses because you didn't get the job done, and whatever process you use to get it here, then that becomes the new normal. And that's important in a couple of ways. One is, as we've pointed out, the totally unprecedented process that was used in the House that violated all notions of due process. There are precedents going back 150 years in the House ensuring that someone accused in an impeachment hearing in the House has due process rights to be represented by counsel, to cross-examine witnesses, to be able to present evidence. They didn't allow the President to do that here. And if this body says that's okay, then that becomes the new normal. And they, they stand up here, the House managers, and say, this body would be unfair if this body doesn't call the witnesses. They talk about fairness. Where was the fairness in that proceeding in the House? And Manager Schiff says things would be arbitrary if you don't do what they say and call the witnesses they want. Well, wasn't it arbitrary in the House when they wouldn't allow the President to be represented by counsel, wouldn't allow the President to call witnesses? There was no precedent in a presidential impeachment inquiry to have open hearings where the president and his counsel were excluded. It also would set a precedent to allow a package of proceeding from the House to come here that the House managers say, well, now we need new witnesses. We haven't done all the work. And it's witnesses they didn't even try to get. They didn't subpoena John Bolton. And they didn't go through the process when other witnesses were subpoenaed. When Dr. Kupperman, Charlie Kupperman went to court, they withdrew the subpoena. And now to say that, well, fairness demands that this body has to do all that work, that sets a new precedent as well. And it changes, it would change for all the future the relationship between the House and the Senate in impeachment inquiries. It would mean that the Senate has to become the investigatory body. And the principles that they assert, they, they did a process that wasn't fair. They did a process that was arbitrary, that arbitrarily denied the president rights. They did a process that wouldn't allow witnesses. And then they came here on the first night. Remember when we were all here until 2 o'clock? and in very belligerent terms said to the members of this body, you're on trial. It will be treachery if you don't do what the House managers say. That's not right. When it was their errors, when they were arbitrary and they didn't provide fairness, they can't project that onto this body to try to say that you have to make up for their errors, and if you don't, the fault lies here. Now, they also suggest that it's not going to take a long time, that they only want a few witnesses. But of course, if things are opened up to witnesses, and it is going to be fair, it's not just one side, it's not just the witnesses that they would want. The president would have to be permitted to have witnesses. And with all respect 
Mr. Chief Justice, the idea that if a subpoena is sent to a senior advisor to the president and the president determines that he will stand by the principle of immunity that's been asserted by virtually every president since Nixon, that that'll just be resolved by the Senate right here, whether or not that privilege exists by the Chief Justice sitting as presiding officer. That doesn't make sense. That's not the way it works. The, the Senate, even when the Chief Justice is the presiding officer here, can't unilaterally decide the privileges of the executive branch. That dispute would have to be resolved in another way, and it could involve litigation, and it could take a lot of time. So the idea that this will all be done quickly, if everyone just does what the House managers say, is not realistic. It's not the way that the process would actually have to play out in accord with the Constitution. And that has another significant consequence. Again, affecting this institution as a precedent going forward. Because what it suggests, the new normal that would be created then is kind of an express path for precisely the sort of impeachments that the framers most feared. The framers recognized that impeachments could be done for illegitimate reasons. They recognized that there could be partisan impeachments. And if this is the new normal, this is the very epitome of a partisan impeachment. There was bipartisan opposition to it in the House. And it was rushed through with unfair procedures, 78 days total of inquiry. Think about that. In Nixon, there had been investigating committees and there was a special prosecutor long before the House Judiciary Committee started its investigation. In Clinton, there was a special counsel, an independent counsel, for the better part of a year before the House Judiciary Committee even started hearings. Everything from start to finish, in this case, from September 24th to the articles of impeachment were considered in the Judiciary Committee was done in 78 days. In 78 days, and for the 71 of them, the president was entirely locked out. So the new normal would be slapdash, get it done quickly, unfair procedures in the House to impeach a president, then bring it to the Senate, and then all the real work of investigation and discovery is going to have to take place with that impeachment hanging over the president's head. And that's a particular thing that the framers also were concerned about. And I mentioned this the other day. In Federalist Number 65, Hamilton warned specifically about what he called, and I'm quoting, the injury to the innocent from the procrastinated determination of the charges which might be brought against them because he understood that if an impeachment charge from the House wasn't resolved quickly, it was hang if it was hanging over the president's head, that in itself would be a problem. And that's why they structured the impeachment process so that the Senate could be able to swiftly determine impeachments that were brought. That's also suggests that's why there is a system for having thorough investigation, thorough process done in the House. And Hamilton explained that delay after the impeachment would afford an opportunity for intrigue and corruption. And it would also be, as he put it, a detriment to the state from the prolonged inaction of men whose firm and faithful execution of their duty might have exposed them to the persecution of an intemperate or designing majority in the House of Representatives. And that's what's happened here. And if you create a system now that makes the new normal a half-baked slapdash process in the House, just get the impeachment done and get it over to the Senate, and then once the president's impeached and you have the head of the executive branch, the leader of the free world, having something like that hanging over his head, then we'll slow everything down 
and then we'll start doing the investigation and just drag it out. That's all part of what makes this even more political, especially in an election year. It's not the process that the framers had in mind, and it's not something the Senate should condone in this case. The Senate is not here to do the investigatory work that the House didn't do. Where there's been a process that denied all due process, that produced a record that can't be relied upon, the reaction from this body should be to reject the articles of impeachment, not to condone and put its imprimatur on the way the proceedings were handled in the House, and not to prolong matters further by trying to redo work that the House failed to do by not seeking evidence and not doing a fair and legitimate process to bring the articles of, impe of impeachment here. Thank you. Mr. Sekulow. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, over a seven-day period, you did hear evidence. You heard evidence from 13 different witnesses, 192 video clips, and as my colleague, the Deputy White House Counsel said, over 28,000 pages of documents. You heard testimony from Gordon Sondland. He's the United States Ambassador to the European Union. You heard that testimony. He testified in the House proceedings. I did not have an opportunity to cross-examine cross him. If we get witnesses, I have to have that opportunity. William Taylor, former acting United States Ambassador to the Ukraine, testified. You heard his testimony. We didn't get the opportunity to cross-examine him. He would be called. Tim Morrison, the former Senior Director for Europe and Russia of the National Security Council. You saw his testimony. They put it up. We didn't get an opportunity. We did not have an opportunity to cross-examine him. Jennifer Williams, Special Advisor on Europe and Russia for Vice President Mike Pence. You saw her testimony. They put it up. I did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we call witnesses, we would have to have that opportunity. David Holmes, the political counsel at the United States Embassy in Ukraine, saw testimony from him. We're not able to cross-examine. If he's called, or if we get witnesses, we will call the ambassador, and we will cross-examine. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, you saw his testimony appear before the House. We didn't have the opportunity to cross-examine him. If we call witnesses, we will, of course, have that right to cross-examine him. Fiona Hill, she is the former Senior Director for Europe and Russia on National Security Council. She testified before the House. If we have witnesses, we have the opportunity to call her then and cross-examine Fiona Hill. Kurt Volker, former United States Special Representative for Ukraine negotiations. They called him. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine. If we're calling witnesses, these are witnesses you've heard from, we would have the right to call witnesses and to cross-examine Mr. Volker. George Kent, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. You saw his testimony. They called him. If we have witnesses, we have the right to call that witness and to cross-examine Deputy Assistant Secretary Kent. The former United States Ambassador to Ukraine, Ambassador Yovanovitch, they called her. You saw that testimony. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. If we have witnesses, we would have to call her. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. They called her. You saw her witness testimony right here. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine her. We would have to be given that opportunity. These are witnesses against the President. Laura Cooper, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. Again, same thing. David Hale, you're not Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. He was called by the House. You saw his testimony. We never had the opportunity to cross-examine. 
If we have witnesses, we have to have the opportunity to do that. There were other witnesses that were called, or you saw their testimony or heard their testimony, where it was referred to Catherine Croft, the Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiations, Department of the State, Mark Sandy, the Deputy Associate Director for National Security Programs, and Christopher Anderson, Special Advisor for Ukraine Negotiation, Department of State. You heard their testimony referred to. We did not have the opportunity to cross-examine them. So this isn't going to happen if witnesses are called in a week. Now, that's just the witnesses that have been produced that you have seen by the House managers. You are being called upon to make consequential constitutional decisions. Consequential decisions for our Constitution. We talk about the burden of proof. I've said this before, I'll, I'll say it again, 31 times the manager said they proved their case, 29 times they said the evidence was overwhelming. Manager Nadler, he didn't only say it was overwhelming in his view. On page 739 of the congressional record, he's very clear. He says, not only is it strong, there is no doubt. That's what he says. The one thing that the House managers think the President and Council's got right is quoting me, talking about Mr. Nadler, Manager Nadler, as saying, beyond any doubt, it is indeed beyond any doubt. Now, of course, we think that they have not proven their case by any stretch of any proper constitutional analysis. In the Clinton investigation, they talk about witnesses being called, but the three witnesses that were called had either testified before the grand jury or before the House committees. These weren't new witnesses. What Mr. Philbin said is, is correct. Under our constitutional design, they're supposed to investigate. You are to deliberate. But what they're asking you to do is now become the investigative agency, the investigative body. If they needed all this additional evidence, which they said they don't need, and by the way, not only did they say it in the record, this is House Manager Nadler, quote, this is on, when he was on CNN back on the 15th of this month, we brought the articles of impeachment because despite the fact that we didn't hear from many witnesses, we could have heard from, we heard from enough witnesses to prove the case beyond any doubt at all. The same can be said of Representative Lofgren. You know we've had, we have evidence proving the case through, for example, at the meeting when Bolton said it was a drug deal. Well, we have fact witnesses. Hill was there, Vindman was there, Sondland was there. So this idea that they haven't had witnesses, is that's the smokescreen. You've heard from a lot of witnesses. The problem with the case the problem with their position is, even with all of those witnesses, it doesn't prove up an impeachable offense. The articles fail. I think it's very dangerous if the House runs up, which they did, articles of impeachment quickly, so quickly that they are clamoring for evidence despite the fact that they put all of this evidence forward. They got their wish of an impeachment by Christmas. That was the goal. But now they want you to do the work they failed to do. But as I said, time and time again we heard, you didn't hear from witnesses, you didn't hear from many witnesses. You, Mr. Schiff modified that a little bit today. A little bit. You heard from a lot of witnesses. But if we go down the road of witnesses, this is not a one-week process. Remember I talked about the waving the wand and Ukrainian corruption in Ukraine was gone. You're not going to have a witness wand here where we just say, okay, you got a week to do this and get it done. There's no way that would be proper under due process. But you know, due process is supposed to be for the person accused. And they are turning it on its head. They brought the articles before you. They're the ones that rushed the case up and then held it before you could actually start the proceedings. But they're the ones that passed the articles before Christmas. You know, we talked a lot about the court 
system and the fact that they were seeking witnesses. And when it got close to actually having a court proceeding, they decided that they didn't want to have that witness go through that proceeding. They actually withdrew the subpoena to moot the case out. How many constitutional challenges will we have in this body because they placed a burden on you that they wouldn't take themselves in putting their case forward? If we look at our constitutional framework and our constitutional structure, um, that's not the way it's supposed to work. Now, our opposition to this motion is rather straightforward, as I've said. We came here ready to try the case on the record that they presented. The record that the managers told us was overwhelming and complete. Mr. Schiff went through every sentence of the articles of impeachment just a few days ago and said, proved, proved, proved. The problem is what it prove, prove, prove is not an impeachable offense. You could, you could have witnesses that prove a lot of things, but if there's not a violation of a law, if it doesn't meet the constitutional required process, the constitutional required substantive issues, of do these articles, these allegations rise to the level of a sufficient for a removal of office? For a duly elected president of the United States, it doesn't. And especially so, especially so, when we are in an election year. I am not going to take the time, your time, which is precious, to go over in each and every allegation about witnesses that I could. I could do it. I could stand here for a long time. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to say this. They created the record. Do not allow them to penalize the country and the Constitution because they failed to do their job. With that, Mr. Chief Justice, we yield our time. Thank you, Counsel. The House managers have 30 minutes remaining. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Uh, Senators, I want to walk through some of the arguments that you've just heard from the President's counsel. The first uh, were arguments made by Mr. Philbin. Mr. Philbin began by saying the House managers assert that you can't have a trial without witnesses. And he said, it's not that simple. Actually, it is. Uh, it is pretty simple. It is pretty simple. In every courthouse, in every state, in every county in the country, where they have trials, they have witnesses. And I think you heard Mr. Philbin tie himself into knots as to why this should be the first trial in which witnesses are not necessary. But you know, some things are just as simple as they appear. A trial without witnesses is simply not a trial. You can call it something else, but it's not a trial. Now, Mr. Sekulow said something very interesting. He said, the House investigates and the Senate deliberates. Well, he would rewrite our Constitution with that argument because the last time I checked the Constitution, it said that the House shall have the sole power of impeachment and the Senate shall try the impeachment, not merely deliberate about it, not merely think about it, not merely wonder about it. I know you're the greatest deliberative body in the world, but not even you can deliberate in a trial without witnesses. But Mr. Sekula would rewrite the Constitution. Your job is not to try the case, he says. Your job is merely to deliberate. That is not what the founders had in mind, not by a long shot. Now, Mr. Philbin says none of these witnesses would have relevance on Article 2, I guess conceding that they would have relevant evidence on Article 1. But that's not true either. Imagine what you will see when you hear from the witnesses 
who ran the Office of Management and Budget, or imagine what you will see when you read the documents from the Office of Management and Budget. What you will see is what they have covered up. What you will see is the motive for their complete obstruction of Congress. When you see not the redacted emails, not the fully blacked out emails that they deign to give in the litigation under the Freedom of Information Act, but you, when you see what is under those redactions, you will have proof of motive. When you see those documents, you will see just how fallacious these non-assertions of executive privilege are. You will see, in essence, what they have covered up. It could not be more relevant to whether their panoply of legal argumentation to justify we shall fight all subpoenas is merely a cover-up in legal window dressing. So these witnesses and documents are critical on both articles. Now, you also heard Mr. Philbin argue, and again, this is where we expected we'd be at the end of the proceeding, which is essentially they proved their case. They proved their case. We pretty much all know what's gone on here. We all understand just what this president did. No one really disputes that anymore. So what? So what? It's a version of the Dershowitz defense. So what? The president could do no wrong. The president is the state. If the president believes that corrupt conduct would help him get reelected if he believes shaking down an ally and withholding military aid, if he believes soliciting foreign interference in our election, whether it be from the Ukrainians or the Russians or the Israeli prime minister or anyone else in any form that it may take, so what? He has a God-given right to abuse his power. And there's nothing you can do about it. It's the Dershowitz principle of constitutional lawlessness. That's, that's the end-all argument for them. You don't need to hear witnesses who will prove the president's misconduct because he has a right to be as corrupt as he chooses under our Constitution. And there's nothing you can do about it. God help us if that argument succeeds. Now, they say that these witnesses already testified, and so you don't need to hear from anybody. There were witnesses who already testified, and so the House doesn't get to call witnesses in the Senate. That would be like a criminal trial in any courthouse in America where the defendant, if he's rich and powerful enough, can say to the judge, hey, judge, the prosecution got to have witnesses in the grand jury. They don't get to call anyone here. They had their chance in the grand jury. They called witnesses in the grand jury. They don't get to call witnesses here. That's not how it works in any courtroom in America. And it's not how it should work in this courtroom. Of course, you heard the argument again, repeated uh, time and time again. The House is saying, they're not ready for trial. Of course, we've never said we weren't ready for trial. We came here very prepared for trial. I would submit to you the President's team came here unprepared for trial, unprepared for the fact that there would be, as we all anticipated, a daily drip of new disclosures that would send them back on their heels. We came here to try a case, prepared to try a case, and yes, we had, I hope, the not unreasonable expectation that in trying that case, like in every courtroom in America, we could call witnesses. That is not a lack of preparation. That is the presence of common sense. They didn't try to get Bolton, they argued. Mr. Philbin said they didn't even try to get Bolton. Of course, we did try to get Bolton. And what he said when he refused to show up voluntarily is, if you subpoena me, I will sue you. I will sue you. He said basically what Don McGahn told us nine months ago. I will sue you. Good luck with that. 
Now, the public argument that was made by his counsel was that he and Dr. Kupperman, uh, out of you know, just due diligence, they just want a court to opine that it's okay for them to come forward and testify. As soon as the court blesses their testimony, they're more than willing to come in. They just are going to court to get a court opinion saying they could do it. And so, of course, we said to them, if that's your real motivation, there's a court about to rule on this very issue of absolute immunity. And very shortly thereafter, that court did. That was the court, Judge Jackson in the McGann case, and the judge said this argument about absolute immunity, which, yes, presidents have always dreamed about and asserted, but which has never succeeded in any court in the land. It was ridiculed in the case of Harriet Myers. It was made short shrift in the case of Don McGahn, where the judge said, no, we don't have kings here. In the 250 years of jurisprudence, there is not a single case to support the proposition that the president can simply say that my advisors are absolutely immune from process. And of course, in every other non-impeachment context where the courts have looked at the issue of a Congress's power to enforce its subpoenas against witnesses or documents, the courts have said the power to compel compliance through subpoena is co-equal, co-extensive with the power to legislate, because you can't do one without the other. If we can't find out whether the president is breaking the law, violating the Empowerment Control Act or any other when he is withholding aid we appropriated from an ally, how can we legislate a fix to make sure that this never happens again? We can't. If we can't get answers, we can't legislate. That is a proposition vindicated by every court in the land, and of course, in the context of impeachment, the courts have said that is never more important. Never more important. Now, I don't know why, after saying he would sue us, and we had to expect that, like Don McGahn, where we are still in court nine months later, I don't know why he's changed his mind. But I suspect it's for the reason that if this trial goes forward and he keeps this to himself, it will be very difficult to explain to the country why he saved it for the book. When he knew information of direct relevance and consequence to a decision that you have to make about whether a president of the United States should be removed from office, it would be very difficult to explain why that was saved for a book. Well, I would submit to you it will be equally difficult for you to explain as it would be for him. But you can ask him that question. Why are you willing to testify before the Senate but not the House? And you should ask him that question. Now, it was uh, said, and, and, and um, it has the, uh, the character of you should have fought harder to overcome our obstruction. The House should have fought harder to overcome our stonewalling. Shame on the House for not fighting harder to overcome our stonewalling. If only they had fought harder to overcome our stonewalling, maybe they could have gotten these witnesses earlier. That's a really hard argument to make while they're stonewalling. You should have tried harder. You should have taken the years that would be necessary to overcome our stonewalling. And the reason why that argument is in such bad faith, as I pointed out to you yesterday, that while they're in this body arguing the House was derelict, slapdash, they should have fought harder and longer and endlessly to overcome our stonewalling. While they're making that argument to you, the House should have fought up and down the courts, from the District to the Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court, and back again. They're in the courthouse arguing the opposite. They're in the courthouse saying, Judge, they're trying to enforce a subpoena on Don McGahn. You need to throw it out. 
They don't have the jurisdiction. This is non-justiciable. You can't hear this case. That is a really hard argument to make. I credit them for making it with a straight face. But that's the character of it. You should have fought harder to overcome our stonewalling and obstruction. Now, they also say the Chief Justice cannot decide issues of privilege. No, the Chief Justice can't make those decisions. You need to let us litigate this up and down the court system. That's a pretty remarkable argument because the Senate rules allow the presiding officer to make judgments to rule on issues of evidence, materiality, and privilege. That is permitted under your own rules. We don't need to go up and down the courts. We've got a perfectly good judge right here. Now, you heard our proposal yesterday that we take a week, just a week, to depose the witnesses that we feel are relevant, that they feel are relevant, and that the justice rules are relevant. Just one week. Now, they can say that the Constitution requires them to go to court, but of course it doesn't. There is absolutely no constitutional impediment from these fine lawyers saying, you know, that's eminently reasonable. We will allow a neutral party, the Chief Justice of the United States of America, to rule on whether a witness is material or immaterial, whether they're being called for purposes of probative evidence or harassment, and whether you're making a proper claim of privilege or merely trying to hide crime or fraud. The concern they have is not that this Chief Justice will be unfair, but rather that he will be fair. But do not make any mistake about it. Do not let them suggest that there is something constitutionally impermissible or it would violate the President's rights to allow the Chief Justice of the United States to make those decisions in this court because he is empowered to do so by your rules and by the Constitution which gives you the sole power to try impeachments. In the sole exercise of your power to try impeachments, you can say, we will allow the Chief Justice to make those decisions. Now, Mr. Sekolo said that you've heard the testimony of 13 witnesses. And I think the impression is meant to be given, if not to you who know otherwise, then maybe to the people watching at home, that they must have been in between errands while watching the Senate trial and missed where those 13 witnesses came before the Senate and testified. But of course, you heard no live testimony in this body. There wasn't any live testimony before this body, and I don't recall any of you in that super secret basement bunker they've been talking about. Now, I'll admit there were 100 members eligible to be there, so maybe I missed one of you. But I don't think you were there for the live testimony in the House. Now, Mr. Sekulow says the President was deprived of his right of calling these witnesses himself and cross-examining these witnesses in the House, but that's not true either because the President was eligible to call witnesses in his defense, defense in the Judiciary Committee and chose not to do so if the President's counsel felt that, you know, Bill Taylor says that he spoke with Sondland right after this phone call with the President and Sondland talked about how the military aid was conditioned on these investigations. The president wanted Zelensky in a public box. And I'd really like to cross-examine that West Point grad Vietnam vet because I don't believe him. You know, they could have called Bill Taylor and the Judiciary Committee and cross-examined him. Or they could have called Mick Mulvaney and put him under oath and let him contradict what we now, John Bolton, would say. But of course they didn't do that. No, they said merely, just get, over, get it over with in the House. 
for all there was too quick, too slapdash, get it over with in the House. Because as the President said, when it comes to the Senate, we'll have a real trial where he gets to call witnesses. But they've changed their tune because now they know what they really have known all along, which is those witnesses would deeply incriminate this president. And so, instead, they have fallen back on the argument that if we're going to go down the road to having a real trial, if we're going to go down the road into having a real trial, we, the president's lawyers, are going to make you pay. And the form of this argument is we are going to call every witness under the sun. We're going to call every witness that testified before the House. We're going to call every witness that we can think of that would help smear the Bidens. We are going to keep you here until kingdom come. That's essentially the argument that they're making when Mr. Sekulow says we're going to bring in Fiona Hill and we're going to bring in Tim Morris and we're going to bring in this witness and bring in that witness. You have the sole power to try this case. You do not have to allow the president's lawyers to abuse your time or this process. You have the power to decide, no, we gave each side 24 hours to make their arguments. We're going to give each side a shared week to call their witnesses. You have that power. If you didn't, you couldn't have constricted the amount of time for our argument. You can likewise determine how much time should be taken with witness testimony. Now, Mr. Sekulow ended his argument against witnesses with where Mr. Philbin essentially began. It all comes back to the Dershowitz principle. What's the point of witnesses if the president can do whatever he wants under Article 2. What's the point of calling witnesses? What's the point of having a trial if the president can do whatever he wants under Article 2? The only constraining principle, and I think that uh, one of the senators asked yesterday, what's the limiting principle in the Dershowitz argument? If a president can corruptly seek foreign interference in his election because he believes that his election is in the national interest, then you cannot impeach him for it, no matter how damaging it may be to our national security. What is the limiting principle? And I suppose the limiting principle is only this. It only requires the president to believe that his reelection is in the national interest. Well, it would require an extraordinary level of self-reflection and insight for a president of the United States to conclude that his own reelection was not in the national interest. Not unprecedented, mind you. I think that was the decision that LBJ ultimately arrived at. But I would not want to consider that a meaningful limitation on presidential power. And neither should you. Finally, counsel expressed some indignance, indignance that we should suggest that it's not just the Senate, it's not just the president, rather, who is on trial here, but it is also the Senate. How dare the House manager suggest that your decisions should reflect on this body? That's just such a calumny. Well, let me read you a statement made by one of your former colleagues. This is what former U.S. Senator John Warner, a Republican of Virginia, had to say. As conscientious citizens from all walks of life are trying their best to understand the complex impeachment issues now being deliberated in the U.S. Senate, the rules of evidence are central to the matter. Should the Senate allow additional sworn testimony from fact witnesses with firsthand knowledge and include relevant documents, he asks. 
As a lifelong Republican and a retired member of the U.S. Senate who once served as a juror in a presidential impeachment trial, I am mindful of the difficult responsibilities those currently serving now shoulder. I believe, as I'm sure you do, that not only is the president on trial, but in many ways, so is the Senate itself. As such, I am strongly supportive of the efforts of my former Republican Senate colleagues who are considering that the Senate accept the introduction of additional evidence that they deem relevant. Not long ago, senators of both major parties always worked to accommodate fellow colleagues with differing points of view to arrive at outcomes that would best serve the nation's interests. I wit I, if witnesses are suppressed in this trial and a majority of Americans are left believing the trial was a sham, I can only imagine the lasting damage done to the Senate and to our fragile national consensus. The Senate embraces its legacy and delivers for the American people by avoiding the risk. Throughout the long life of our nation, federal and state judicial systems have largely supported the judicial norms of evidence, witnesses, and relevant documents. I respectfully urge the Senate to be guided by the rules of evidence and follow our nation's judicial norms, precedents, and institutions to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law by welcoming relevant witnesses and documents as part of this impeachment trial. That is your colleague, former Senator John Warner. Senators, there is a storm blowing through this Capitol. Its winds are strong and they move us in uncertain and dangerous directions. Jefferson once said, I consider trial by jury as the only anchor yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. The only anchor ever imagined yet imagined by man by which a government can be held to the principles of its constitution. I would submit to you, remove that anchor, and we are adrift. But if we hold true, if we have faith that the ship of state can survive the truth, this storm shall pass. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Mr. Chief Justice. The Majority Leader I is recognized. the absence of a quorum. The Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander.
Okay, colleagues, if everyone would return to their desk. <clears throat> I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. The Democratic leader and I have had an opportunity to have a discussion, and it leads to the uh, following. We'll now cast a vote on the witness question, and once that vote is complete, I would ask that the Senate stand in recess, subject to call of the chair. Thank you. Without objection. So ordered. The question is, shall it be in order to consider and debate under the impeachment rules any motion to subpoena witnesses or documents? The yeas and nays are required under Senate Resolution 483. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. No. no. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Aye. Mr. Barrasso. No. No. Mr. Bennett. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn? No. no. Mr. Blumenthal? Mr. Blunt? No. no. Mr. Booker? Yes. Aye. Mr. Bozeman? No. no. Mr. Braun? No. no. Mr. Brown? Aye. Aye. Mr. Burr? Oh, no. no. Ms. Cantwell? Aye. Mrs. Capito? No. Mr. Cardin? Aye. Aye. Mr. Carper? Aye. Aye. Mr. Casey? Aye. Aye. Mr. Cassidy? No. No. Ms. Collins? Aye. Aye. Mr. Coons? Aye. Aye. Mr. Cornyn? No. No. Ms. Cortez Masto? Aye. Aye. Mr. Cotton? No. No, Mr. Kramer. No, no Mr. Crapo. No. no, Mr. Cruz. No, no Mr. Danes. No. no, Ms. Duckworth. No. I, Mr. Durbin. No. I, Mr. Inzi. No. no, Ms. Ernst. Yes. Mrs. Feinstein. No. I, Ms. Ernst, no. Mrs. Fisher? No. No. Mr. Gardner? No. no. Mrs. Gillibrand? Aye. Aye. Mr. Graham? No. no. Mr. Grassley? No. Ms. Harris? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hassan? Aye. Aye. Mr. Hawley? No. no. Mr. Heinrich? Aye. Aye. Ms. Hirono? Aye. Aye. Mr. Hoven? No, Mrs. Hyde Smith. No. no, Mr. Inhofe. No, Mr. Johnson. No, no Mr. Jones. Aye. Aye. Mr. Kane. Aye. Aye. Mr. Kennedy. No. no. Mr. King. Aye. Aye. Ms. Klobuchar. Aye. Aye. Mr. Lankford. No. no. Mr. Leahy. Aye. Mr. Lee? No. no. Mrs. Leffler? No. no. Mr. Manchin? Aye. Aye. Mr. Markey? Aye. Aye. Mr. McConnell? No. no. Ms. McSally? No. no. Mr. Menendez? Aye. Aye. Mr. Merkley? Aye. Mr. Moran? No. no. Ms. Murkowski? No. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Aye. Mrs. Murray? Aye. Aye. Mr. Paul? No. no. Mr. Purdue? No. no. Mr. Peters? Aye. Aye. Mr. Portman? No. no. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Risch? No. Mr. Roberts? No. Mr. Romney? Aye. Ms. Rosen? 
Aye. Mr. Rounds? No. No. Mr. Rubio? No. no. Mr. Sanders? Aye. Aye. Mr. Sass? No. no. Mr. Schatz? Aye. Aye. Mr. Schumer? Aye. Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida? No. No. Mr. Scott of South Carolina? No. Mrs. Shaheen? Aye. Aye. Mr. Shelby? No. Ms. Cinema? Aye. Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Aye. Ms. Stabenow? Aye. Aye. Mr. Sullivan? No. no. Mr. Tester? Aye. Aye. Mr. Thune? No. Mr. Tillis? No. Mr. Toomey? No. Mr. Udall? Aye. Mr. Van Hollen? Aye. Mr. Warner? Aye. Ms. Warren? Aye. Mr. Whitehouse? Aye. Mr. Wicker? No. Mr. Wyden? Aye. Mr. Young? No. Mr. Blumenthal? Aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to change his or her vote? No, the yeas are 49. If not, the yeas are 49, the nays are, the nays are 51. But the, motion is it's not agreed to. the motion is not agreed to. Under the previous order, the Senate stands in recess subject to the call of the chair.
The Senate will come to order. The Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> I send a resolution to the desk and ask the clerk to report. The clerk will report. <clears throat> Senate Resolution 488 to provide for related procedures concerning the articles of impeachment against Donald John Trump, President of the United States. Resolved that the record in this case shall be closed and no motion with respect to reopening the record shall be in order for the duration of these proceedings. The Senate shall proceed to final arguments as provided in the impeachment rules, waiving the two-person rule contained in Rule 22 of the Rules of Procedure and Practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials. Such arguments shall begin at 11 a.m. on Monday, February 3rd, 2020, and not exceed four hours, and be equally divided between the House and the President to be used as under the rules of impeachment. At the conclusion of the final arguments by the House and the President, the Court of Impeachment shall stand adjourned until 4 p.m. on Wednesday, February 5th, 2020, at which time the Senate, without intervening action or debate, shall vote on the articles of impeachment. Justice. Mr. Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent <clears throat> that the Democratic leader or his designee be allowed to offer up to four amendments to the resolution. Further, that I be recognized to make a motion to table the amendment after it's been reported with no intervening action or debate. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I have a parliamentary inquiry. The Democratic leader will state the inquiry. Is the Chief Justice aware that in the impeachment trial of President Johnson, Chief Justice Chase, as presiding officer, cast tie-breaking votes on both March 31st and April 2nd, 1868? I am, Mr. Leader, uh, the one concerned a motion to adjourn, the other concerned a motion to close deliberations. Uh, I do not regard those isolated episodes 150 years ago as sufficient to support a general authority to break ties. If the members of this body, elected by the people and accountable to them, divide equally on a motion, the normal rule is that the motion fails. I think it would be inappropriate for me an unelected official from a different branch of government to assert the power to change that result so that the motion would succeed. Now, Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena Mulvaney, Bolton, Duffy, Blair, and the White House, OMB, DOD, and State Department documents, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. <clears throat> Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1295. At the appropriate place in the matter following the resolving clause, insert the following. Section, notwithstanding any other provision of this. The amendment be considered as read. Objection, so ordered. The majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. No. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr. Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito. Mrs. Capito, 
Aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy, aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Cotton, no. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer. Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes. Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. Enzi. Aye. Mr. Enzi, aye. Ms. Ernst. Ms. Ernst, aye. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mrs. Fisher. Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Gardner. Mr. Gardner, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Graham. Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan. Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley. Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Heinrich. Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Hirono. Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Hoven. Mr. Hoven, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith. Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mr. Inhoff. Aye. Mr. Inhoff, aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Jones, no. Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. King. No. Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar. Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Langford. Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee. Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler. Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. McConnell. Mr. McConnell, Aye. Ms. McSally. Aye. Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Murphy. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Purdue. Mr. Purdue, aye. Mr. Peters. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman. Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Risch. Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Romney. Mr. Romney, aye. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen, no. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Sass. Mr. Sass, aye. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of Florida, aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina, aye. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Mr. Shelby, aye. Mrs. Cinema. No. 
Ms. Cinema, no. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Stabenow, no. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Tester, Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Ms. Warren, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Whitehouse, Mr. Whitehouse, no. Mr. Wicker, Mr. Wicker, Aye. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Does any member in the chamber wish to change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The motion is agreed to. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena John R. Bolton, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1296. At the appropriate place in the resolving clause, insert the following. Section, notwithstanding any other provision of this resolution pursuant to rules five and six of the rules of procedure and practice in the Senate when sitting on impeachment trials, the Chief Justice of the United States, the Secretary of the Senate, shall issue a subpoena for the taking of testimony of John Robert Bolton, and the Sergeant at Arms is authorized to utilize the services of the Deputy Sergeant at Arms or any other employee of the Senate in serving the subpoena authorized to be issued by this section. The majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment. I ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. No. Mr. Barrasso? Aye. Aye. Mr. Bennett? No. no. Mrs. Blackburn? Aye. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal? No. no. Mr. Blunt? Aye. Aye. Mr. Booker? No. no. Mr. Bozeman? Aye. Aye. Mr. Braun? Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown? No. Mr. Burr? Aye. Ms. Cantwell? No. Mrs. Capito? Aye. Mr. Cardin? No. Mr. Carper? No. Mr. Casey? No. Mr. Cassidy? Aye. Ms. Collins? No. Mr. Coons? No. Mr. Cornyn? Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto? No. Mr. Cotton? Aye. Aye. Mr. Kramer? Aye. Mr. Crapo? Aye. Mr. Cruz? Aye. Mr. Danes? Aye. Ms. Duckworth? No. Mr. Durbin? No. Mr. Enzi? Aye. Ms. Ernst? Aye. Mrs. Feinstein? No. Mrs. Fisher? Aye. Aye. Mr. Gardner? 
Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand? No. Mr. Graham? Aye. Mr. Grassley? Aye. Ms. Harris? No. Ms. Hassan? No. Mr. Hawley? Aye. Mr. Heinrich? No. Ms. Hirono? No. Mr. Hoven? Aye. Mrs. Hyde-Smith? Aye. Aye. Mr. Inhofe? Aye. Mr. Johnson? Aye. Aye. Mr. Jones? No. Mr. Kane? No. Mr. Kennedy? Aye. Mr. King? No. Ms. Klobuchar? No. Mr. Lankford? Aye. Mr. Leahy? No. Mr. Lee? Aye. Mrs. Leffler? Aye. Mr. Manchin? No. Mr. Markey? No. Mr. McConnell? Aye. Ms. McSally? Aye. Mr. Menendez? No, Mr. Merkley. No, Mr. Moran. Aye, Ms. Murkowski. Aye, Mr. Murphy. No, Mrs. Murray. No, Mr. Paul. Aye, Mr. Purdue. Aye, Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Portman? Aye. Aye. Mr. Reed? No. Mr. Risch? Aye. Aye. Mr. Roberts? Aye. Aye. Mr. Romney? No. no. Ms. Rosen? No. Mr. Rounds? Aye. Aye. Mr. Rubio? Aye. Mr. Sanders? No. Mr. Sass? Aye. Mr. Schatz? No. Mr. Schumer? No. Mr. Scott of Florida? Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina? Aye. Mrs. Shaheen? No. Mr. Shelby? Aye. Ms. Cinema? No, Ms. Smith. No, Ms. Stabenow. No, Mr. Sullivan. Aye, Mr. Tester. No, Mr. Thune. Aye, Mr. Tillis. Aye, Mr. Toomey. Aye, Mr. Udall. No, Mr. Van Hollen. No, Mr. Warner. No, Mr. Ms. Warren. No. no, Mr. Whitehouse. No, Mr. Wicker. Aye, Mr. Wyden. No, Mr. Young. Aye. Are there any senators in the chamber wishing to vote or change his or her vote? If not, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The motion is agreed to. The Democratic leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to subpoena John R. Bolton, provided further that there be one day for a deposition presided over by the Chief Justice and one day for live testimony before the Senate, both of which must occur within five days of the adoption of the underlying resolution, and I ask that it be read. The clerk will report.
The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer, proposes an amendment number 1297. At the appropriate place of the matter following the resolving clause. Be considered as read. So order. The majority leader is recognized. I move to table the amendment and ask for the A's and A's. Are there, is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker. No. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown. No. Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr. Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell. No. Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito. Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Cardin, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper, no. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey, no. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy, aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins, no. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons, no. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn, aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. Ms. Cortez Masto, no. Mr. Cotton. Aye. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer. Aye. Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo. Aye. Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes. Aye. Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth. Aye. Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. Enzi. Mr. Enzi, aye. Ms. Ernst, Ms. Ernst, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Harris. Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan, Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, Aye, Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye, Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Jones. No, Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kane. No, Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. Kennedy. Aye, Mr. King. No. Mr. King. No, Ms. Klobuchar. No. Ms. Klobuchar. No, Mr. Langford. Aye. Mr. Langford. Aye, Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee, aye. Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler, Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Menendez, no, Mr. Merkley. Mr. Merkley, no. Mr. Moran. Aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Murphy. No. Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Perdue. Mr. Perdue, aye. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Reed, 
No. Mr. Risch. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Aye. Mr. Romney. Mr. Romney. No. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen. No. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rounds. Aye. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Rubio. Aye. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. No. Mr. Sass. Mr. Sass. Aye. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schatz. No. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Schumer. No. Mr. Scott of Florida. Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen. No. Mr. Shelby. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Ms. Cinema. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow. No. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester, no. Mr. Thune, Mr. Thune, aye. Mr. Tillis, Mr. Tillis, aye. Mr. Toomey, Mr. Toomey, aye. Mr. Udall, Mr. Udall, no. Mr. Van Hollen, Mr. Van Hollen, no. Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner, no. Ms. Warren, no. Ms. Warren, no. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Mr. Young. Aye. Is there any member in the chamber who wishes to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 51, the nays are 49. The motion is agreed to. Mr. Chief Justice. The Senator from Maryland. Mr. Chief Justice, I send an amendment to the desk to have the Chief Justice rule on motions to subpoena witnesses and documents and to rule on any assertion of privilege. And I ask that it be read. The clerk will report. The senator from Maryland, Mr. Van Hollen, proposes an amendment number 1298. At the appropriate place in the matter, following the resolving clause, insert the following. Notwithstanding any other provision of this resolution, the presiding officer shall issue a subpoena for any witness or any document that a senator or a party moves to subpoena. If the presiding officer determines that the witness or document is likely to have probative evidence relevant to either article of impeachment before the Senate and consistent with the authority of the presiding officer to rule on all questions of evidence, shall rule on any assertion of privilege. Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, I move to table the amendment and ask for the yeas and nays. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Aye. Ms. Baldwin. No. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Aye. Mr. Bennett. No. no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal. No, Mr. Blunt. Aye. Aye. Mr. Booker. No, Mr. Bozeman. Aye. Aye. Mr. Braun. Aye. Aye. Mr. Brown. No, Mr. Burr. Aye. 
Ms. Cantwell. No. Mrs. Capito. Aye. Mr. Carden. No. Mr. Carper. No. Mr. Casey. No. Mr. Cassidy. Aye. Ms. Collins. Aye. Mr. Coons. No. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. No. Mr. Cotton. Aye. Mr. Kramer. Aye. Mr. Crapo. Aye. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Danes. Aye. Ms. Duckworth. No. Mr. Durbin. No. Mr. Inzi. Aye. Ms. Ernst. Aye. Mrs. Feinstein. No. Mrs. Fisher. Aye. Mr. Gardner. Aye. Mrs. Gillibrand. No. Mr. Graham. Aye. Mr. Grassley. Aye. Ms. Harris. No. Ms. Hassan. No. Mr. Hawley. Aye. Mr. Heinrich. No. Ms. Hirono. No. Mr. Hoven. Aye. Mrs. Hyde-Smith. Aye. Mr. Inhofe. Aye. Mr. Johnson. Aye. Mr. Jones. No. Mr. Kane. No. Mr. Kennedy. Aye. Mr. King. No. Ms. Klobuchar. No. Mr. Lankford. Aye. Mr. Leahy. No. Mr. Lee. Aye. Mrs. Leffler. Aye. Mr. Manchin. No. Mr. Markey. No. Mr. McConnell. Aye. Mrs. Ms. McSally. Aye. Mr. Menendez. No. Mr. Merkley. No. Mr. Moran. Aye. Ms. Murkowski. Aye. Mr. Murphy. No. Mrs. Murray. No. Mr. Paul. Aye. Mr. Purdue. Aye. Mr. Peters. No. Mr. Portman. Aye. Mr. Reed. No. Mr. Risch. Aye. Mr. Roberts. Aye, Mr. Romney. Aye, Ms. Rosen. No, Mr. Rounds. Uh, aye, Mr. Rubio. Aye, Mr. Sanders. No, Mr. Sass. Aye, Mr. Schatz. No, Mr. Schumer. No, Mr. Scott of Florida. Aye, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye, Mrs. Shaheen. No, Mr. Shelby. Aye, Ms. Cinema. No, Ms. Smith. No, Ms. Stabenow. No, Mr. Sullivan. Aye, Mr. Tester. No, Mr. Thune. Aye, Mr. Tillis. Aye, Mr. Toomey. Aye, Mr. Udall. No, Mr. Van Hollen. No, Mr. Warner. No, Ms. Warren. No, Mr. Whitehouse. No, Mr. Wicker. Aye, Mr. Wyden. No, Mr. Young. 
I. Is there any senator in the chamber wishing to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The motion is agreed to. The question occurs on the adoption of Senate Resolution 488. Is there a sufficient second? There is. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander. Aye. Mr. Alexander, aye. Ms. Baldwin. Aye. Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Barrasso. Aye. Mr. Barrasso, aye. Mr. Bennett. No. Mr. Bennett, no. Mrs. Blackburn. Aye. Mrs. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Blumenthal. Aye. Mr. Blumenthal, no. Mr. Blunt. Aye. Mr. Blunt, aye. Mr. Booker. Mr. Booker, no. Mr. Bozeman, Mr. Bozeman, aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Braun, aye. Mr. Brown, Mr. Brown, no. Mr. Burr, Mr. Burr, aye. Ms. Cantwell, Ms. Cantwell, no. Mrs. Capito, Mrs. Capito, aye. Mr. Carden, Mr. Carden, no. Mr. Carper. Mr. Carper. No. Mr. Casey. Mr. Casey. No. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Cassidy. Aye. Ms. Collins. Ms. Collins. Aye. Mr. Coons. Mr. Coons. No. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn. Aye. Ms. Cortez Masto. Ms. Cortez Masto. No. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Cotton, aye. Mr. Kramer, Mr. Kramer, aye. Mr. Crapo, Mr. Crapo, aye. Mr. Cruz, Mr. Cruz, aye. Mr. Danes, Mr. Danes, aye. Ms. Duckworth, Ms. Duckworth, no. Mr. Durbin, Mr. Durbin, no. Mr. Renzi, Mr. Renzi, aye. Ms. Ernst. Ms. Ernst, aye. Mrs. Feinstein, Mrs. Feinstein, no. Mrs. Fisher, Mrs. Fisher, aye. Mr. Gardner, Mr. Gardner, aye. Mrs. Gillibrand, Mrs. Gillibrand, no. Mr. Graham, Mr. Graham, aye. Mr. Grassley, Mr. Grassley, aye. Ms. Harris, Ms. Harris, no. Ms. Hassan, Ms. Hassan, no. Mr. Hawley, Mr. Hawley, aye. Mr. Heinrich, Mr. Heinrich, no. Ms. Hirono, Ms. Hirono, no. Mr. Hoven, Mr. Hoven, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mrs. Hyde Smith, aye. Mr. Inhofe, Mr. Inhofe, aye. Mr. Johnson, Mr. Johnson, aye. Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, no. Mr. Kane, Mr. Kane, no. Mr. Kennedy, Mr. Kennedy, aye. Mr. King, Mr. King, no. Ms. Klobuchar, Ms. Klobuchar, no. Mr. Langford, Mr. Langford, aye. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Leahy, no. Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, aye. Mrs. Leffler, Mrs. Leffler, aye. Mr. Manchin, Mr. Manchin, no. Mr. Markey, Mr. Markey, no. Mr. McConnell, Mr. McConnell, aye. Ms. McSally, Ms. McSally, aye. Mr. Menendez, Mr. Menendez, no. Mr. Merkley. Mr. Markley, no. Mr. Moran, aye. Mr. Moran, aye. Ms. Murkowski, 
Ms. Murkowski, aye. Mr. Murphy, Mr. Murphy, no. Mrs. Murray, Mrs. Murray, no. Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, aye. Mr. Perdue. Mr. Perdue, aye. Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, no. Mr. Portman, Mr. Portman, aye. Mr. Reed, Mr. Reed, no. Mr. Risch, Mr. Risch, aye. Mr. Roberts, order. Mr. Roberts, aye. Mr. Romney, Mr. Romney, aye. Ms. Rosen. Ms. Rosen, no. Mr. Rounds, Mr. Rounds, aye. Mr. Rubio, Mr. Rubio, aye. Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders, no. Mr. Sass, Mr. Sass, aye. Mr. Schatz, Mr. Schatz, no. Mr. Schumer, Mr. Schumer, no. Mr. Scott of Florida, Mr. Scott of Florida, Aye, Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye. Mr. Scott of South Carolina. Aye, Mrs. Shaheen. Mrs. Shaheen, no. Mr. Shelby. Aye. Mr. Shelby, aye. Ms. Cinema. No. Ms. Cinema, no. Ms. Smith. No. Ms. Smith, no. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow, no. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Sullivan. Aye. Mr. Tester. Mr. Tester. No. Mr. Thune. Mr. Thune. Aye. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Tillis. Aye. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Toomey. Aye. Mr. Udall. Mr. Udall. No. Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Van Hollen. No. Mr. Warner. Mr. Warner. No. Ms. Warren. No. Ms. Warren. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Whitehouse. No. Mr. Wicker. No. Mr. Wicker. Aye. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Wyden. No. Mr. Young. Aye. Mr. Young. Aye. Is there any member in the chamber who wishes to vote or change his or her vote? If no, the yeas are 53, the nays are 47. The resolution is agreed to. Mr. Majority Leader. Mr. Chief Justice, <clears throat> I ask unanimous consent that the Secretary be authorized to include statements of senators explaining their votes, either given or submitted during the legislative sessions of the Senate on Monday, February 3rd, Tuesday, February 4th, and Wednesday, February 5th, along with the full record of the Senate's proceedings and the filings by the parties in a Senate document printed under the supervision of the Secretary of the Senate that will complete the documentation of the Senate's handling of these impeachment proceedings. Without objection, so ordered. <laughs> Further, I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate resumes legislative session on Monday, February 3rd, Tuesday, February 4th, and Wednesday, February 5th, the Senate be in a period of morning business with senators permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each for debate only. Without objection, so ordered. <clears throat> and finally, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 11 a.m. February 3rd and that this order also constitute the adjournment of the Senate. Without objection, so ordered.
We are adjourned.